The full version of this book, Dragon Queen Scarlet Rain, is available for purchase in both ebook and paperback versions on Amazon. Chapter 16 A Fairy Named Jane Kara pounded on the bark door of the strange house. A sing song, coming, came from within. Aylwin continued to stare at the world around her, marveling at the tall grass and seemingly giant insects. A ladybug that gently fluttered by looked as big as her hand. The door slammed open, causing Aylwin to jump. Hiya! A female fairy cried, her round face speckled with freckles. Her thin form bounced forward, a long strawberry blonde ponytail bobbing behind her. The name's Jane Florence! How can I help ya? She gave a beaming white smile. Aylwin blinked in surprise, then glanced at Kara. Hey Jane, we need a shift necklace for this one. Kara motioned her head towards Aylwin. Ah! Jane cried causing Aylwin to wince. The fairy grabbed her two visitors' hands and dragged them inside the building. They were directed to sit at a pair of stools made of silver coins strapped to twig legs. A coffee table sat between them. It was covered in bits and baubles of all kinds, including a tray of tiny sweets. Go ahead and take one! Jane motioned to the sweets before flittering over to her drawer and pulling out a notepad pen and strange-looking magnifying glass. Aylwin looked around the living room in awe. Slowly, she took one of the sweets. The circular floor was carpeted in light purple moss, and the metal walls were covered almost entirely with blueprints for various contraptions. Sketches, scribbles, and fully fleshed out plans were plastered in irregular fashions, designs with similar ideas grouped together. Beside the seating arrangement was a spacious drawing desk that was set before a large window. Pieces of chalk and graphite were carved into pencil-like shapes, while a cut sliver of wood marked with ink acted as a ruler. These utensils were scattered about the desk haphazardly. A half-finished sketch of what looked like a steam-powered boat lay under a cookie-filled bowl made of a half of a walnut shell. Bark doors leading to other rooms were closed. Jane sat at the desk, swiveling her magically floating leaf chair to face them. She rested her hand on her palm and leaned on the drawing. So, I heard your Princess Aylwin. Yes, I am indeed she. Aylwin gave a small wave, popping the sweet into her mouth. And you're on our side now! Jane gave another wide grin. Oh wow, this is great! This is amazing! This is perfect! You've been to Ruby City, right? Oh, you've got to tell me what it's like there. I've heard so many stories of technological marvels and a place for scientists to freely- Kara sighed and raised an eyebrow. Jane, focus. Jane's smile disappeared and she cleared her throat. Yes, of course, sorry. She flicked her fingers, and a necklace around her throat gently lifted, twirling slowly before Aylwin. This is a shift necklace. It is used by pretty much every creature who desires to transform on a regular and sudden basis. It takes whatever clothes, bags, or jewelry you have on your person, and stores them when you change to another form. That way, they won't be damaged when you change back. It also works vice versa, so anything you have donned as a dragon would be stored while human. It also has a self-dressing feature. When you change back to human, it will quickly and almost instantaneously materialize your clothes and bags where you had them before. The gem in the center of the necklace is almost like a small pocket reality, able to hold a good number of things in the aether of the universe. Very, very handy. Definitely a must-have for shifters and fairies. Jane took a sweet of her own and chewed on it. She abruptly slammed her desk with one hand, causing one of the pencils to flip upward into the air. It landed directly in her hand. She grinned, twirled it, and then thwacked the tip against a blank notepad in her other hand. Let's do this! Aylwin almost wanted to laugh at Jane's bursting personality, but instead she just smiled. All right, she agreed, getting caught up in the excitement. First off, I need to analyze your scales and determine their composition. The center gem must be made of the same material as your scales in order to work properly. Jane flittered over to Aylwin, waving her hand. Immediately, Aylwin's fingers of her right hand began to sprout scales and her fingernails morphed into claws. Jane placed her strange magnifying glass over them. She gave a loud, hmm, and rubbed her chin with her finger. She took a small needle tool from her desk and scratched it at a scale. At first glance, I thought these were rubies, but it looks like these scales are made from a mineral in the garnet family, Jane announced. Pyrope, it looks like. The semi-dark red color, the microscopic crystal structure, and its reaction to physical distress confirms this. She sat up, flipping her strawberry blonde ponytail behind her back. 
Well, looks like your necklace will have a pyrope gem at its center. Interestingly enough, the name pyrope actually means fire eye. That's why I like to call it bloodshot. <laughs> Jane laughed so hard she snorted repeatedly. <laughs> Aylwin blinked in confusion, and Kara rolled her eyes. Because if an eye is bloodshot, it can feel like it's on fire. I guess? Jane's laugh trailed off. Uh, anyway, let me get that gem for you. She flew to a door on the right side of the room, unlocked it, and dashed through. Eowyn looked at Kara with a half-smile. Well, she's certainly energetic. Uh-huh. A pocket watch hung on the wall over the front door, ticking slowly in the awkward silence. So, I noticed your hair is all black, without a noticeable shifter streak in it. Does that mean your dragon form is black, like ebony? Kara snorted. Nah, I dyed my streak. Didn't like it. Why? Meh. Meh what? I said I didn't like it, that's all. Uh, okay. Aylwin folded her hands in her lap, looking away. Jane popped back into the room, her cheeks as red as the carved gemstone she now carried. It was about the size of her eye. She displayed it before Aylwin, who gazed at it in quiet awe. It was stunningly beautiful, in the exact color of her scales, a slightly darkened red. Now, for the design of the necklace to hold it. I have several pre-made ones ready for any gem to be popped into them. You can take a look through my notebook where I have several sketches of what they look like. Aylwin accepted the stack of bound papers and casually flipped through them. Necklaces of all kinds were contained within, from long, dangling pendants to elegant chokers. The latter caught her eye. A silver ribbon made up the bulk of the piece, while twisting copper vines bearing tiny metal leaves wrapped around the edges and created the gem holder. Aylwin pointed at the choker. I'll have this one, please. Right, right, sounds good. I'll fetch this for you. This time, Jane zoomed into the room on the left. After a few moments and a large, crashing noise, Aylwin and Kara stared when they heard her begin to scream. James, what did you do? Jane's voice screeched from behind the door. A man's voice piped up. I don't know, I just wanted to see what would happen if- No, 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 I told you not to touch the automaton oil canisters. Now look what's happened. I just can't believe. Hey, girl, calm down. Look what I just discovered. I don't care about your experiments, I care about mine. Take your filthy things out of my workshop. Jane laid out a frustrated sigh. I swear, if this happens again, I will not do anything. I'm your poor orphaned cousin, the male voice proclaimed. You can't just kick me out, else... That's not what I meant. What I'm saying is that I'll... The heated conversation went on a bit longer, each person interrupting the other over and over. Eventually, it ended with a great harumph, and Jane exited the room to meet the wide-eyed gazes of her visitors. Random splotches of oil covered her from head to toe, and her hand was clasped a small box. Here, she grumbled, tossing the box to Aylwin, who managed to catch it with fumbling fingers. My cousin, yes, that was him, Jane said as if the girls had asked. Unlike myself, who is an esteemed engineer and geologist, he decided to take up the science of... She grimaced. Biology... She t looked at her visitors as if expecting them to react in kind. When they didn't, she narrowed her eyes. You know, the most disgusting of sciences has to do with blood and guts and gross, squishy things like that. <laughs> I prefer things neat, clean and exact, which engineering offers in droves. I just can't understand him, I mean. Aylwin elected to ignore the rest of the fairy's words and opened the box while nodding as if listening. The choker necklace, wrapped in soft tissue paper, was absolutely beautiful. It reminded her of the green one her father had given her for her 10th birthday. Her nimble fingers clicked the gem into place within its holder. She lightly touched it, feeling the shiny smooth surface. Looks okay, Kara commented with a shrug of shoulder. Huh? Jane stopped her ramblings. Well, I think it looks quite nice. Thank you for visiting me. I'd be glad to have you stay longer, but I've got a situation to properly deal with. Good. 
Kara sniffed at Jane's angry glance before tossing her a packet of coins. Here's the pay. Pay? Aelwyn asked. You're paying for the necklace? Yeah, stuff like that doesn't come free, Kara continued. Since you don't have any money, Mom gave me some to spend for you. Oh, I'll make sure to thank her, and thank you for taking me as well, Aelwyn said earnestly. Kara shrugged again. Wait! I just realized something! Jane exclaimed. If this little one is to end up traveling beyond the village at some point, Aylwyn stiffened at the use of the phrase, little one, then surely she will need a sort of disguise. That's actually a good point. Kara rubbed her nose. A bunch of people in the city would be bound to recognize her. Aylwyn looked from Kara to Jane. Are you sure? Just because I'm the princess doesn't mean many would know my face. It's not like everyone, save for those who have visited the capital, have seen it. Kara gave a half smile. Jane gave a small giggle from behind her hand. Aylwyn's brows lowered. What is it? Jane pointed to Aylwyn's chair. Undo your tush, girl! Aylwyn pulled up her skirts and raised herself off of the chair, looking below her. She gasped as her own face stared back at her. The coin the chair's seat was made out of had her likeness imprinted upon it. The currency of the country bears the royal family's faces upon them, Jane said, and since everyone handles money. You're bound to be recognized, Kara finished. Aylwyn winced. I'll work on a solution, but I must insist you leave now. I apologize. Jane got up, flying to the door and opening it. See you later. Aylwyn wanted to explore the fairy village further, but Kara told her that Delku and Bavari needed to speak with her. Thus, a disappointed Aylwyn and indifferent Kara had exited the village, turning into humans when they traveled back through the tunnel. In the village, the afternoon sun spread over the busy Kowanan settlement. Kara escorted Aylwyn to the largest tent in the place, the one containing the historical paintings. Standing outside the entrance was a young dark-skinned man with bright orange curly hair. His face held chiseled, sharp features, yet he seemed very friendly and approachable. His ears, unlike shifters, were furry and dog-like. A long, fluffy, orange-brown tail wagged behind him, and he held a platter of perfectly prepared sandwiches and muscle-bound arms. Kara, he called out with a fanged smile. I thought you girls might still be hungry, so I made some more food. Kara strode up to him with strong, pounding steps. With an aggressive motion, she wrenched the tray out of her arms and slammed it into a surprised Aylwyn's hands. Grasping the collar of the man's shirt, Kara lifted him off of the ground, then slammed his face into hers in a passionate, slurping kiss. Aylwyn's mouth lay ajar. She didn't know whether to look away in embarrassment or watch in awe. Kara placed her hands on the back of his head to cuddle him closer. The man replied by curling his fingers around her hip, eventually grasping her- Good heavens. Aylwyn looked away, blood rushing to her cheeks. A few moments later, Kara tapped on Aylwyn's shoulder. This is Chev. He's my husband. I... I noticed. Aylwyn handed the tray back to Chev. Hey there, nice to meet you. Chev beamed. Like I said before, I figured you might still be hungry, so I made even more for you. Sorry if you're still full. I can take it back to the kitchen if you are. Aylwyn smiled back, her face still a dark shade of pink. No, it's alright. That is very gracious of you. I enjoyed the other treat immensely. I was very hungry, to be perfectly honest. Chev nodded in delight. Glad to hear. Anyway, you'd better get inside. Bavaria and Delku are expecting you. They say it's important. Aylwyn grabbed a sandwich before the couple walked away, still staring into each other's eyes. She pursed her lips. At least they seem to be happy with their very public relationship. Can't say everyone else in the village likely feels the same way. She gave a tiny grin before looking back at the flaps of the tent behind her. Well, here we go. She took a deep breath and fingered her necklace. Let's hope this isn't as shocking as last time. To be continued in Chapter 17, Downed Dragon. You can purchase Dragon Queen Scarlet Rain in both paperback and ebook versions on Amazon.com. Also, special thanks to my supporters on Patreon. <laughs>